Dames en heren, ladies and gentlemen. Het is acht uur. Het is eight o'clock. We'll, uh, we'll start. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Berens. I'm the publisher of philosophy and history at uh, Bone Publishers Amsterdam. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this Zoom conference. Um, Bohm is the publisher of the beautiful book by Virginie Marie, which in French is called La part sauvage du monde, Penser la nature dans l'anthropocène, or in Dutch, Het wilde deel van de wereld, over de natuur in het anthropocène. We are very honored to be able to publish this important book, and we are also very grateful to Virginie Marie and also to René ten Bos for sharing their ideas with us on this evening. I would also like to thank SPI 25 for organizing this meeting, as always very professional. And I would like to thank L'Institut Français Peba for its subsidy contribution to make the translation possible. And I would like to thank Mieke van Heemert for her translation of the book of Virginie Marie. Virginie Marie, our lead guest of this evening, is an environmental philosopher at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique and the Center for Functional and Evolutionary Ecology. Her research focuses on biodiversity, nature conservation, nature values, and the relationships between ecology and economy. Het wilde deel van de wereld is the first book of hers to be published in Dutch language. René ten Bos was the Dutch Thinker Laureate from 2017 to 2019. René is a professor at the University of Nijmegen. His interests are very broad from management philosophy to meteosophy, the wisdom about the weather, the topic of his new book. In the Netherlands, René ten Bos is well known for his books on the Anthropocene, Wonder in the Anthropocene from 2017, and on the phenomenon of extinction, the book Extinction that was published in 2019, also by Bohm Uitgevers. Therefore, René is preeminently qualified to enter into a debate with Virginie Marie. In short, I am very curious about the positions of Virginie Marie and René Tendos and the discussion between them. Is wild nature imaginable without humans or humanity? Or is the Anthropocene an inevitable fact? Virginie and René, the Zoom is yours. Hello. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Good evening, Virginie. Um, I, um, well, um, Mark was just suggesting that we should have a debate, but I propose that it should be a nice conversation in which we try to make clear what the book is uh, all about. So um, I, I uh, read the French one, it appeared with soil, soil and, um, and there is uh, the Dutch one. Yeah, and it is, an, um, I read it with uh, admiration and uh, it, it, one of the best things about the book is that it is so clearly written. So you have a very lucid uh, kind of prose, which is uh, rather uncommon in philosophy. Uh, what, uh, you know, everybody can understand the book, I think, even though there are some very profound uh, insights behind it. But uh, where did you uh, acquire this habit of uh, lucid writing? Well, I must admit that um, it's important for me to be read and understood by uh, non-specialists of uh, philosophy. Um, I work in a lab which is uh, specialized in uh, ecology and evolutionary biology, so I'm uh, surrounded by scientists and I also teach to scientific uh, students. 
and maybe I read this book mainly for them. Uh, my colleagues in um, scientific ecology, evolutionary biology, and um, conservation biology first, and all these students, managers, people who are directly involved in biodiversity, conservation, management, studies, etc. So it was important for me to be um, read and understood by these people first. But I also uh, have to say that I'm quite uh, influenced by uh, um, uh, American and Anglo-Saxon philosophy, which is more analytical, and I myself have a background in science and philosophy of science. So I'm not, I do not need to make a great effort to be simple, because I'm just used to think simply and to speak simply or as simply as I can. So uh, I do not come from uh, this philosophy, which I admire, but which is not mine, uh, of French and continental tradition, which is used to invent new concepts and make long sentences, etc., uh, etc. Et so it's not a big effort for me. It's quite natural. Okay. Ne nevertheless, you, one of your sources of inspiration is the French philosopher Frédéric Nera. And, uh, Indeed. Yeah, and he is one of those authors who, uh, who, who writes, well, inaccessible prose, very difficult, typical French stuff. <laughs> That's funny because I know Frédéric, Frédéric Nera, who uh, he's edited in the same collection than me in French, uh, Anthropocene Collection yeah. at the Seuil. And um, we've been written our books quite simultaneously. He's one... Uh, uh, appeared maybe one year before mine, but sometimes I think that he read. We have read the same book for a different public, <laughs> okay, and okay. Uh, it's not the same book because we do not have the same influence, etc. But we really share a strong intuition, and I think we're going to come back to it later. But we really share a strong intuition about the importance of. Um, alter alterity and exteriority of nature. So we were surely led by the same um, concern for yeah. an advocacy of the spontaneity and exteriority of nature, but in very different tradition and style. Yeah, yeah, same uh, thoughts, but uh, different styles. You, you, you can say, but your book immediately reminded me of some of his uh, central themes as well. I teach uh, about Nera, um, but, but, um, but let's not talk about him. We should talk about uh, your book and um, what you deliver in the book is, is not only a, a kind of debate about concepts such as the Anthropocene, but also, um, uh, 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 I think, a history of a concept. And this is the concept of nature. And uh, you nicely delineate um, the, 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 the different ideas about nature that have been proposed throughout uh, the ages. And uh, perhaps you can uh, tell... Um, the, the public, something, the audience, something about that. So, so um, there are different ideas about nature. Of the happy yes, <clears throat> in the, I, I guess it's in the first chapter of the book, uh, maybe the first of the second, I must admit that uh, I did not read it uh, for, uh, for a while. Um, I try to, uh, distinguish three different meanings of the concept of nature, meanings that have, uh, that have um, 
let's let's begin with the first one the first yeah. meaning that we can find in the history of philosophy his nature considered as a totality uh, it's the whole uh, cosmos nature in this meaning is everything that is under the sky let's say to tell it like a, a greek philosopher and um, just to be um, able to, to differentiate this different meaning, I use their antonymy. The contrary of this nature as totality is surnatural or metaphysical. The second meaning of uh, nature that we can find in the history of philosophy uh, is rather um, has rather to do with the idea of normality. N what is natural is what is often the case. Uh, and uh, we can differentiate, we can distinguish two kind of normality or naturality in this uh, sense. The first one is more statistical what is often the case, what I am used to observe or I am used to do is natural. And the other meaning is, uh, has more to do with good functioning. What is natural is what functions as it must do. Um, the second sense is uh, quite uh, important in all the um, stu Stoicism, Stoistic uh, mm -hmm. tradition, for instance, and to follow the nature is to follow what is good for us. The third meaning uh, become more uh, important and maybe prevalent uh, with the modern um, scientific revolution. And uh, it's a definition which is always um, uh, binary, natural or nature is then considered as the opposite of cultural, artificial or human. Uh, this is the big dualist framework that we considered uh, being at the root of uh, Western uh, worldview. The idea that there is a strong separation between what humans do and what is done by itself. This nature... And, 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 uh, and so, sorry, that, and this kind of separation always involves uh, uh, a hierarchy, you can say. That is to say there's That's something... exactly... Yeah, okay. The, the heart of my uh, prospect in this book is to disentangle the separation and the hierarchy. So now we arrive in the, in the core uh, matter of my uh, argument or my, uh, what I want to do with this book. Um, this third meaning of nature could be considered as nature uh, as alterity, as otherness. Uh, the first one was totality, the second one was normality, the third one is otherness. And this sense of otherness uh, has been, um, has been um, um, biased by the modern scientific uh, period, uh, biased with a strong hierarchical um, feature, but the separation itself, the fact that things can, um, things can go by their own way, that there is autonomy in the world and there are a lot of things that completely escape to human design, to human rationality, um, He's a long, uh, has a long history in Christianity itself, in Greek philosophy also. So my aim in this book is 
to, and I think we are going to go further with this, but my aim was to disentangle the separation and the hierarchy in order to be able to criticize and to reform the hierarchy between human beings and the rest of nature without totally uh, disqualify or totally abandon um, the otherness, the exteriority, the separation and the speciality of non-human um, living beings and uh, ecological phenomena, etc. So that was the great challenge. Yeah, yeah, but this, this, this is also uh, a kind of provocation to what many ecologists nowadays say, and they talk about that there is no difference between uh, nature and culture. All nature has been uh, is anthropogenic or is anthropized. These kind of words, you use them yourself. And uh, you can also say, for example, that your compatriot, Philip Descola, the, the, the famous uh, uh, anthropologist, um, uh, who wrote his book, Or de la de la nature, eh, which means in English, beyond nature, uh, argues that nature is a rather um, uh, uh, strange concept if you look at peoples all over the world. Most people don't adhere to such a concept. And then there is uh, Frédéric Nera, of course, and there is uh, Virginie Maris, and they argue, yet we should cling to this uh, concept. So what do you think about that? Yes, it's quite, first, it's an old fashioned concept. And second, maybe some of the most exciting and revigorating studies in environmental humanities um, has been uh, has mainly um, um, has strongly criticized the concept of nature as the root of our uh, environmental crisis. The concept of nature being this dichotomical concept that exerts us from the rest of the living beings and the rest of uh, uh, nature uh, is uh, supposed to be a typically uh, Western concept and to be the concept that authorizes and encourage uh, the domination and control of nature by human beings. So it was quite a bad candidate <laughs> to, yeah. to and, and, and just to, to, to say to, to say uh, a couple of words about the, the thinkers you've mentioned. For instance, Philippe Descola in French, his book is entitled Par de la nature et culture. In the context of Philippe Descola, he He's not, uh, um, he's not an opponent of the concept of nature. He just show and remind us how uh, local and how ethnocentric this way to differentiate between human and non-human yeah. is. And he showed that in different culture, you have different way to separate things and that the sharp line between humans and other than humans beings yeah. is very um, provincial. Uh, and uh, um, so it's not a judgment about it. It's just uh, an observation. And it's important, I guess, for us to, to be reminded uh, how um, historically and socially determined are our concepts, our words, our worldviews. Um, yeah, but Descola is, of course, the anthropologist. That is to say, he is the scientist and, uh, and philosophers always think something else. Or they think, let's say, in a different way. And, um, and, and, and one of the concepts that a lot of scientists seem to have embraced, and this is, of course, in the subtitle of the book as well, uh, that is uh, Penser la nature dans l'anthropocène, 
um, and thinking nature in the era of the Anthropocene is precisely this concept of the Anthropocene that, that, um, that, that you take issue with. What do you have against a concept that has been widely embraced by precisely those scientists? So I have maybe I wish to develop two lines of uh, answers about this question. About the concept of Anthropocene itself, uh, I think it's important for us to um, take uh, advantage of all the studies that have shown how the uh, contemporary environmental crisis is not the fact of human beings as a species. To name our contemporary era with the anthropo, which is human, um, may uh, blur or even hide the strong political issues at stake in the environmental uh, crisis, the strong um, domination patterns, the strong social fights that have led to our situation. That's why a couple of uh, academics propose not to target the whole humanity with such a, a um, uh, an all-encompassing concept uh, as Anthropocene, but rather to target precisely um, the real um, lever, the real um, um, engineers of our crisis. Some of them propose to talk about um, Capitalocene, Britannocene, to target yeah, to people like Jason Moore and, and yeah, yeah. Others uh, like uh, um, um, Malcolm Ferdinand in France par, uh, and uh, Donna Haraway are talking about plantation to yeah. show how the slave um, economy and the slave market has um, as led us where we are now. So um, that is a very uh, formal um, critics about this kind of Anthropocene. It may give the impression that what we are experiencing now is just a matter of fact, it's just the whole history of humanity and the whole history of the earth that is at stake, um, where, uh, whereas I, I think it's important to show that we are in a political fight, in a political arena, and that we ha should not be blind to the varied responsibility and varied costs of this crisis um. of the populations. On, the, on, a, uh, on another... Um, for other reasons, uh, my concern with Anthropocene, and maybe that's the uh, importance of this uh, term and theme in uh, academical uh, research that gave me the idea to write this book, uh, is that up to some point to declare that we are in the era of human, uh, is a way to to resign. Is a way to abandon uh, the the idea of nature, the the idea that something can be there without our design, without our, our control. And uh, I think that the Anthropocene could be um, could give some excuse or even be an acceleration of the human control on the whole planet. And if we look to the first authors that have used this concept, like Paul Crudzen, for instance, but yeah, yeah. A, a couple of other uh, scientists 
Most of them were climatologists or um, geochemical chemists. Chemist. Yeah, chemist. Um, chemist. Yeah. Um, most of them are um, uh, are sharing or were sharing because Paul Crudson just died, but were sharing the idea that now we are in the era of humans. So now we have to um, wisely and unlikely take the control over the planet. A lot so that, of yeah, geoengineering projects, for instance, have been advocated with this idea of Anthropocene. We should change everything at the surface of the globe. Yeah, so, the, so behind your idea of nature as an alterity is, as I see, first of all, uh, a, a polit political concern, and because you cannot simply say that humanity as such is to blame, as Karl Marx used to say, humanity is just a stupid uh, generality, and 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 uh, you know some people are more to blame than others which is precisely the yes. political uh, thing. And, uh, but, but uh, there is also this, this concern that if you abandon the concept of nature, then um, what exactly uh, are you planning to uh, conserve? And, uh, to con uh, and, and um, this is a point that Nera makes, this point that Andreas Mal makes, of course, so you, we, we need somehow this idea of nature. And uh, my question to you is, is um, um, you, you opt of your defense, the idea of nature as an alterity. And this is this, this nicely, um, that's the way you present it, is, is, um, it, it, it's intertwined with the notion of uh, le sauvage, eh? um, which, normally translates as as uh, as wild wild eh, wilderness and so on uh, we should not uh, uh, translate sauvage i think with savage this, which is of course a different different thing but perhaps you can um uh, explain to the Dutch viewers what precisely you understand by this idea of sauvage and why is it is and why it is so important to adhere to it? Well, indeed, it's really hard to find a good word for that, even in French, but uh, when we try to translate it, two words came to mind. The first one is wilderness and the other one is wildness. And there is a lot of uh, works by Cronan, Donovan and other yeah, academics yeah. and uh, ecological environmental historians who have shown how um, American thinkers uh, have been um, have been um, um, excuse me help me have been uh, fascinated uh, yeah, by yeah. by an idea of wildness which is a fantasy which have never existed which is much more uh, the result of the um, eradication and the ethnocide of uh, local and native people, etc. So the wilderness uh, concept is a, a concept really problematic and by the way, it has nothing to do with the continental and European context because this idea that there are um, immense huge spaces that have never been touched, uh, etc. Um, just refer to nothing, at least in France, uh, in metropolitan France. So um, in my view, the idea uh, was to advocate for and to revalorize 
um, the sauvage as a process, as an autonomy of uh, biological entities. Uh, some of them can be just beings, like wild animals, for instance, beings that have not been domesticated or um, unduly controlled by human activities, but it also can be uh, some species or communities, biological communities, which um, develop their own evolutionary trajectory. So there is a gradient of sauvage, of wildness in different entities, but it's still important to keep some big areas, important areas with a lot of space and a lot of time to develop these own potentialities of natural beings at their Apart optimum from the human or being. maximum. Yeah. So apart from so, uh, all involvement, th that is to say the human involvement with it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It, so the, the great question yeah. is, uh, what kind of human interaction is uh, compatible with this exp expression of the autonomy of the wild? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, in many cases, so just the fact not to have any extractivist, productivist activities in a natural area um, is enough or is reasonably enough to ensure this autonomous process to uh, yeah. develop themselves. But sometimes we need more. Sometimes we need to exclude, for instance, at certain period of the year because of the necessity of reproduction of some species, for instance, or, uh, or just because at the beginning of the development of, a, of a, an ecosystem, it could be very fragile. So I, I, I'm not against the idea that it can be necessary sometime to no. exclude any human uh, presence. And that is quite a, a difficult position to defend that, uh, that uh, there, there is a lot of issues uh, with that. But I guess that if we cannot um, go as far as this uh, idea that human beings are now so uh, powerful, so numerous, so um, aggressive to natural ecosystems that we should retain control, limited ourselves. We should limit ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, yes, I think we wouldn't cope with the uh, crisis we live without a certain sense of auto-limitation. Okay, I, I get this completely, but, but um, one of the obvious objections is, of course, where do you still find these uh, uh, wild parts, these uh, sauvage par? And where are they, the, the set par sauvage? And, and, and so, that, that, that's, an, um, um, that, that's of course a question and, and, and in, 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 in my mind is also this, this rather fanciful uh, publication by Ed Wilson, the, the very old uh, famous biologist who published a couple of years ago this book, uh, Half Earth, which you uh, know, I know from your book. And, and um, is it an idea to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, let Earth uh, fend for itself without or intrusion into it? I think it's a, it's a good idea and it's even a necessity. Uh, so to answer the question, where do we find the space for that? Um, no. First, uh, it's 
estimated that now maybe a little less than one quarter of the land uh, at the at the uh, on the planet uh, is could be considered as wild that means there, there are different way to calculate this uh, the number of people living uh, the density of human beings living the nativity of uh, plants and uh, species etc so one quarter is not that bad and this quarter is strongly attacked is threatened every day and it's not threatened by people who want to hunt for their own living or people who want, want to build a shed for uh, sleeping. No, it's under threat by all the um, great industry of exploitation, uh, mining, oil and gas uh, production, and also for the uh, rainforest sports, uh, either uh, palm oil or uh, soya and uh, extensive uh, grazing of beef for exportation. So the uh, indus agro industrial production of soya and palm, the energy of oil and gas, and uh, the mines and the necessity to consume more and more stuff like all this organic uh, numeric device we, we use and replace every year, blah, blah, blah. These are the three main threats for this little quarter that, that still is uh, vivid and living on the planet, not the survival of indigenous people. Um, yeah. That's for one hand. On the other hand, we shouldn't think just about these um, very far uh, areas. I don't know how things are going in Netherlands, but for instance, in France, uh, we now know that in the 10 coming years, half of the farmers will take their retreat. All these farmers, not all, but most of them have strongly, have been strongly engaged in the farming <laughs> revolution, the industrialization of farming with always bigger and bigger exploitation and uh, uh, more and more um, monocultural way to, to work, blah, blah, blah. It's the same in and, the rich, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I guess that a uh, strong revolution, not just a reform, a revolution in our way to produce food will totally change, could totally change the landscapes, even in our very uh, um, crowded uh, country. And this change could allow to let much more places to wild nature, not big areas, but corridors, um, trees, uh, part of the of the culture themselves, etc, etc. So I think that I, uh, are you therefore ex still... sorry, are you therefore excited by the idea of rewilding and uh, I'm, uh, by, um, I must admit that, us. yeah, uh, um, I'm working on this seriously, and I must, uh, and I think my next book, no, I don't think, I'm sure <laughs> that my next book uh, will be on this issue, because I found it uh, fascinating, and under the concept of rewilding, there are many, many different things uh, some of them, and I know, but I won't try to pronounce the name of it, but there is a famous experience of rewilding in, in Netherlands. All those Platten? In the Oosterpark. Plassen. Oosterpark, Plassen, yeah. Um, Near to Amsterdam. That is, that is quite representative of one way to think about rewilding as um, reintroducing great herbivores. The, the, this yeah. has to do with uh, 
herbivory and to reopen the the, the environments with wild uh, grazing, blah blah blah. But other uh, other experiments are have more to do with laissez faire, just uh, free evolution, for instance, in forests. Uh, and other ones are completely crazy with the uh, re, um, um, resurrection of extinct uh, species like mammoth and uh, other extinct species. Uh, so under the term of rewilding, there are many, many this different is, things. Yeah, this is what people refer to as de-extinction and that's... An, uh, yes, de-extinction. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the term. Yeah, interesting uh, concept as well. But 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 um, Virginie, uh, wait a minute, because uh, I think we should end our conversation here. And I'm yes. just saying that I uh, thoroughly enjoyed your book. It's very interesting. Of course, I have some issues with it, but uh, that's uh, that, that's just uh, academic strife. Don't worry, it's a fantastic book, and. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend it, but I also want to end our conversations because I see questions popping up in my screen. And I think we should allow uh, people to get in and to uh, immerse in the conversation. So um, perhaps somebody can help us. Mark is there and uh, thanks so far. And now we see whether people have uh, interesting questions uh, for you. Uh, one, que one question that I saw, Mark, was uh, about uh, degrowth. Indeed. Uh, do you I'll have try. any? Uh, yeah, sorry, Mark. I'll try to moderate to the, the questions. Yep. There indeed is a question for Virginie. Are you familiar with the concepts and ideas of degrowth? If yes, is this what you mean when you say that humanity should limit itself and her consumption? Uh, yes, indeed, there is a quite a, um, an important tradition of uh, thinking about degrowth in France, and uh, with uh, which we name decroissance, with journals and economists we have um, popularized this idea. Indeed, they did not popularize it that much because degrowth is often think like uh, a scary thing that we really should not talk about. And for instance, it's just anecdotal, but that's say a lot too much. But for instance, uh, Macron, our uh, French president, have recently in one discourse, in, in one uh, exchange, um, mentioned something like, because th there is a, a public debate about the 5G, uh, 5G, uh, this new network cell phone uh, technology. There is a, uh, a debate in France and some cities do not want, want to implement it because uh, that's going to impose uh, an explosion of uh, electricity consuming and our electricity mainly depends on nuclear um, production, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Macron have said, uh, we, we are not Amish. And uh, Amish, can we, can you, do you understand that? So it's always the idea of Amish and to come back to the candle. Uh, every techno skeptical discourse is directly associated with a kind of uh, back to candle uh, argument. Um, indeed, I think that the growth of the volume of our consumption is absolutely necessary. And this cannot be done without an economy of degrowth, uh, an economical degrowth. So I'm not familiar, uh, I'm not specialist of uh, the degrowth movement as an economic theory, but I'm definitely very, um, very close and very uh, uh, yeah, uh, sympathetic to the idea. Not just sympathetic, I think it's uh, obvious that we cannot do 
uh, uh, other, uh, we can not do different, uh, we do not have the choice to degrow. The idea is whether we choose our pattern of degrowth or where, whether we just uh, go from one collapse to the other, uh, waiting to, to, to things to happen. I must uh, also add that in my area of specialization, which is more, um, which has to do with biodiversity sciences and biodiversity conservation, these ideas of limits, the planetary boundaries, for instance, the idea that we live in a limited planet and that a lot of things uh, could not be infinitely developed. Um, in the context of biodiversity, we already have uh, faced the limits. The limits have already been overpassed. And that should be kept in mind. We have lost so many species, so many natural environments. So when you think about energy or uh, some resources, you can say, okay, we have to plan a degrowth for uh, the peak oil or for whatever. But concerning biodiversity, we already have outpassed the limits. Thank That's you. not funny. Uh, René, do you want to react or? Yeah, well, uh, I, I published this book uh, on the extinction, which of course should find a French translation as well. But, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, this is precisely where, uh, in terms of biodiversity, or uh, in terms of genetical or functional uh, 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 diversity, we are deeply into red zones. So the issue here is not that we are going to solve the problem. The issue is rather that uh, uh, is how we are going to mitigate uh, the problem. And um, you, you know, you have this famous international organizations, the IPBES. This is doing what uh, IPCC is doing for climate. IPBES is doing for biodiversity. And they have some ideas, they are developing ideas on how to tackle it. But one of the key terms here is complexity. And uh, complexity means that there are always limits on, uh, on, on, on manageability, on governmentality, and, and, and so on. So you cannot um, um, arrange everything the way you would like to do. And um, it is, it's difficult. They, they developed uh, uh, the concept of transformational change. And as one of its members once explained to me, it's basically just about uh, 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 switching the buttons and, and, and some, something needs to be done here, something needs to be done there, and so on. It's completely uh, an, an, an uh, entanglement of, uh, of, of different uh, challenges and different questions. So, uh, and, and I think that, that um, the loss of biodiversity is one of the severest uh, threats that uh, we have to face at the moment. So I agree. Okay, thank you. Then we'll go to another question, also for Virginie. Is your position different from environmental conservation? In what sense? Well, I'm not sure I, um, I'm not sure I understand this question well. If uh, uh, maybe Rene, uh, do you uh, because I, I know quite well the movement of um, biological conservation, the conservation of biodiversity, blah, 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 blah. But environmental conservation, does it refer to a special political movements or? Uh, I, I fear I do not catch exactly what is environmental conservation in the question. I, Maybe I, if I, I, you have some, uh, an idea to help me uh, just to figure out what is- No, no, no. I, I 
So don't worry, I didn't get the question uh, neither. Um, uh, I know that there is a debate in, in uh, conserv conservational uh, philosophy. For example, should we uh, um, try to, to um, save uh, species at all costs? Or what does it mean for individual species to, uh, to, to, to be deprived of social context? because they have been uh, reduced in numbers so much. And, and these kinds of questions are being developed, but the idea okay. of, yeah, but, but it's- uh, but it, Yeah, but I guess I, I can under, uh, answer if there is not a, a hidden political meaning uh, that I do not catch with this environmental conservation. If I think about conservation uh, at large, uh, Yes, I, I, I'm really, um, I, I think about myself as being part of the conservation movement. Uh, I'm surrounded by conservationists. Uh, so not the political conservationists, the biodiversity conservationists. I, I just want to be absolutely sure that this is clear for everyone. Even if we can discuss uh, if there are some links between a certain uh, political moral conservationism and nature conservation. But that's not the issue, the, the, the discussion now. Uh, I'm part of it. And I think that maybe conservation, because of this word conservation, could have been uh, um, um, attacked or accused to be fixist and to want nothing to change, to keep the species as they are, to keep the, um, the, the forest and wild areas as they are. And there is a French expression which surely have uh, an equivalent in English, which is mettre sous cloche, uh, to put under a bulb. Bulb? No? Do you, do you see this? Uh, by the way, to freeze uh, things, to be conservationist would be to, to, to want nothing to change. It's a very, um, it's a false uh, accusation. Conservationist and the more famous conservation biologist, you have mentioned um, Wilson, but we can also mention Michael Soule or uh, those uh, biologists and uh, activists that have put the conservation of biodiversity at the political agenda uh, are, are uh, evolutionists, uh, are, are thinking as evolution biologists. And today, sometime when you try to conserve a natural area or natural species, you um, just try to allow it to follow its own evolutionary path. The idea is not to freeze it. The idea is to let it evolve in its own way. Uh, so in this sense, yes, I, I, I think I'm part of uh, the conservation movement and I must also notice that there is a new debate in conservation which uh, opposed the uh, old-fashioned conservationists, which who I like a lot, <laughs> and the neo-conservationists, the new conservationists. And for instance, I've mentioned Earl Ellis earlier or someone like uh, Peter Kareva are people uh, very uh, um, interested with this Anthropocene discourse and Anthropocene uh, spirit. And uh, what they say is that now human um, influence is everywhere. So we should not um, lose our time to try to retain something from the past that could never exist again. We should embrace this brand new future and we should decide what nature must be in order to fulfill 
human interest, but also in order to um, just uh, flourishing itself, blah, blah, blah. And there is in conservation this uh, opposition, which is almost generational between the old school conservation who want to retain something that is disappearing under our eyes, and those who claim that it's too late, and now we should engineer the brand new future. Uh, and for this, GMOs could be, or the extinction or uh, all technologies could be part of the, of the, um, of the toolkit for uh, new conservation. So I, I, I'm, I must admit that maybe because I'm nostalgic or just because I'm sure we can do more than nothing about uh, nature, I'm more um, close to the old fashioned conservationist. Okay, th thank you, Virginie. This is um, um, a nice um, um, natural uh, step for the third and last uh, question. What actors or institutions should take up or have a leading role in changing our patterns and ways with nature? For instance, politics, education, and or industry? Oh, that's a great question. That, uh, um, first, uh, René has mentioned the IPBS, the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is a um, biodiversity IPCC. Um, that's uh, I've been part of their works on values, and uh, it's the, the, the last um, global assessment uh, was really uh, catastrophic and uh, not catastrophic. Can I say that? Catastrophic? Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Should, should be, should, should should serve as a, um, a, a, a motivational uh, tool for policymakers to uh, change the path. They give very uh, precise recommendations about some uh, consumption um, patterns, etc. So. There is a dialogue to have between uh, science and political institution. However, I must admit that I'm less and less confident that the policymakers um, will take their responsibility toward nature, but also toward uh, future generation and humanity itself. Uh, I hope things are better in your country, but in mine, it's just depressing. So it's better not to wait too much, to uh, hope too much uh, from uh, policy makers, at least at the international or national levels. We should find other ways of change, of transformation. One of them, it's just, uh, so it's not an answer at this too big question for me, but just some, um, some, yeah, some examples or some inspirational uh, examples. Uh, in France, for instance, there is um, an association who, who, which has decided to uh, open a large crowdfunding in order to buy a big area, a big forest, indeed it was a, a past uh, hunting reserve uh, in the Vercors, which is uh, in the Alps, something like um, 500 uh, hectares. And, uh, and they just bought it and decided that this place would be totally exclusively dedicated to free evolution. Um, 
And uh, they found a lot of people, I don't know exactly how many people have uh, give money for that, but something like, I, I, I don't want to, to, to um, make a mistake, but I think it's about 3,000 people. It's not that much, but 3,000 people have decided together that they want to give money in order to buy something that they will never use, they will never um, take any benefit, just to give it back to nature. Um, I think a lot of us just cannot deal with the consumerist and uh, other consumerist uh, path. I, I think I also think that the sanitary crisis have changed uh, people much more than they have changed institute institution or uh, enterprise. So yes, I'm sorry, it's not a, it's not an answer. I do not have the answer, but I think that we should look to the flourishing of very diverse and grassroots um, um, energies rather than wait for the United Nation or the President of Republic to uh, resolve the problem. And even less to the big enterprise which just take the benefit out of the destruction of nature. Okay, uh, thank you, Virginie. It's um, it's uh, nine o'clock. Um, um, uh, as uh, as the moderator, I'll take the privilege of the last uh, question. Um, are, are you optimistic that mankind will be able to save uh, the last parts of the wild uh, nature? Do, do you think, within now and one hundred uh, years? Well, wild nature will still be um, available on uh, on Earth, or should we be uh, pessimistic? Mm. No, I'm definitely pessimistic. I think uh, that's horrible. I just cannot finish a conference with such pessimistic st statement. But I think that wild nature some of it, most of it, all the little things will just make their way through time. What we are losing now is the big wild nature, big mammals, old trees, all these big things are disappearing uh, under our eyes. Rhinoceros, elephants, giraffe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think that's going to be hard to, um, to to protect them because of a lot of factors. However, I think that human beings are now endangering themselves in such a dramatic way that I'm most more um, concerned and anxious about the destiny of our own community and even our own species. Uh, I've read this book about wild nature. I love wild nature, and I think it's a grief. It's a, it's just such a big loss not to have been capable to cohabitate with all these fantastic animals. But as a citizen, as a mother, as uh, just human beings, I'm even more. Uh, pessimist about what we are doing to us. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thank you. But, 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 because for instance, I, I'm sorry, I, I know it's finished, but I, I just want to uh, give you some uh, numbers, which maybe for those of uh, us who don't know them, it's crazy. Um, let's say uh, something like 12,000 years ago, so before domestication, 
it has been uh, evaluated that three, less than 3% of the whole uh, terrestrial vertebrate biomass was human beings and more than 97% was wildlife. If we make the same calculus uh, today, the result is that the whole, ma uh, whole verte ma uh, terrestrial vertebrate biomass is bigger now, but it's composed something like 30% of human beings, 67, 67% of domesticated animals, of livestock, and less than 3% of wildlife. That's totally crazy. There are more chicken on the whole planet than any other bird. Um, more pigs than any other mammals. So we are in a situation which is totally crazy. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I think that wildlife is just the last remaining of the past uh, evolutionary story of million and million, million of years. And we are crazy to destroy it like this. Yeah. Not very constructive for a conclusion. I'm sorry. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, it's a good warning for us. You've given us something uh, to think uh, about. And uh, we thank you very much for uh, thinking uh, wild uh, nature together with uh, with us. Um, uh, your book has just been published in a Dutch uh, language. Uh, of course, I can recommend it to everyone to uh, buy and read, uh, read it. I want to thank you Virginie, very much, um, as I already said, for thinking uh, wild nature together with uh, us. And I also want to thank, to thank uh, René for the discussion and for his uh, thoughts on um, on this important uh, topic. Uh, thank you very much. And I think we'll, uh, we'll finish uh, this, uh, this, uh, this meeting. Thank you very much to uh, SPY 25. Thank you very much uh, to, the, uh, to the audience. And you've given us uh, something uh, to, uh, to think of, uh, about. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank to you, Marc and René, for this discussion, which has been really, really interesting and stimulating. And I also want to thank the editor and the translator of the book. Uh, I have no idea of what life it will have uh, in Netherlands, but it's really, yeah, it's really nice to, to take this chance for it to live in another, in another language. So thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.